It's always interesting to share with uh, people that are not your own. My, my church uh, know that, that I'm 27 um, and I'm young, I'm hip, I've got my skinny jeans on. Um, I'm all that. And uh, yeah, so, so it's important that you recognize my youth when I speak to you. It's important because you'll receive better. <laughs> all right. But I have to put these on because it does not because I need them. It just makes me look intelligent. So I just wanted to share a little bit with you. Uh, um, George said you guys have a service that's about 30 minutes or so. That's normally my introduction. I'm, I assume my, my messages normally go, I, take a, I start a message and I have to have a series out of the one message because after 30 years of ministry, you kind of can't help but talk about stuff. And I know, of course, I know my people love me, so they love listening to long messages. I, I, you've got a slide up there, um, if you can put that slide up. Who are you wearing? Have you ever heard that statement? Ever stood, seen the red carpet at Hollywood? Have you ever watched television and they, they stand, the presenters stand before the people and say, listen, who are you wearing? You know, and then they say, it's Gucci, and I've got Prada this, and I've got, you know, I don't know all the name brands. I wear MR Priest myself. <laughs> and um, and so, so they all describe all these outfits they wear. I, I, we were in Dubai recently, and we went to the mall there, and there was a, <clears throat> a um, I think, I, I stand corrected, I think it was a, what was the shop? Uh, that doesn't matter, some famous brand. Actually, I'm not brand conscious. That's why I've got a guess shirt on. Um, and anyway, they had this gaudy looking dress on, and I thought, you know, people pay so much money for this thing. It's like literally made of chiffon, and it's got some beadwork on it. It's a 130,000 rand dress. And when you walk on the red carpet and you, you begin to walk and you, they, they ask you these questions, who are you wearing? That kind of can be a question we ask ourselves as Christians. Who are you wearing? Or if you want to a different way, what are you wearing? Um, have you ever worn an outfit that really wasn't good? It really didn't suit you. And you walked out the house and your wife said, what are you wearing? Or she says, are, are you going to wear that? <laughs> Ever had that? Just me? No. <laughs> and sometimes we look at the outside and we, I, I like to sit at coffee shops. I love studying people. I, I can watch people for hours. It's kind of like work. I can watch work for hours as well. <laughs> but, uh, but I sit and watch the people and I can see that, that some people get dressed in the morning and they look in the mirror and they say, that looks really good. They've got pink hair, fishnet stockings, a mini skirt, a crop top with their belly hanging out. And they looked in the mirror at that moment and they thought, gee, I look good. And everybody else goes like this. What is she wearing? Or him, for that matter. We, we recently went to Cape Town to a museum and I've discovered that I'm absolutely useless at being culturally uh, irrelevant. I mean, I, I go to a museum and I look at some of the art and I say, listen, I absolutely have no idea what they're trying to say here, you know. So I've got no culture. So you have to understand, when I speak, there's a disclaimer here. Everything I say, is you can't blame the church. It's, it's, it's me. Uh, so things come out of my mouth that, are, that probably shouldn't come out at times. But you find that you get dressed in the morning and you put the same clothes on, the clothes that you're comfortable with, and you wear those same clothes. And most of the time we are comfortable in what we wear. Um, but there are certain things that we should eliminate out of our wardrobe, isn't it? How many of you have got too many clothes in your cupboard? Just us two. Okay. My daughter, sitting in the front here, has more shoes than anybody I know. I mean, I don't know when she's going to wear all these shoes, but she's got shoes. Have you checked them out yet? I, I don't believe that. <laughs> But you, you, you're inclined to go to the, the, the thing that you like the most, and you put that shirt on. It might have holes in it, but you're comfortable. And, and your wife looks at you and you say, really, are you going to wear that? Maybe it's not a good idea for you to wear that. Maybe you should think about getting yourself some new clothes. My wife tells me that all the time. Um, but I don't know about you, but I hate the process of shopping for clothes. I hate the process of take on 
try on, um, this is what women do, not all women, my wife doesn't like this so much, but I've, I know, I've been around women a lot, my, my daughter's one of these people, I just want to try that on, so you're going to buy it, how does it look, no, it's, it's lovely, you're going to buy it, no, no, I just wanted to see what it looks like, now I couldn't think, I can't think of anything worse, and just try and close them just to see what it looks like, I can't, or they buy clothes and they take it in April and they bring it back the next day, try it on, I, 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 just shopping isn't for me. But how would you answer this question if somebody said to you, who are you wearing in terms of your spiritual life? How would you answer that question? Who are you wearing? Who do you identify with? What belief system do you identify with? When you walk out the the door, is somebody going to say, are you going to wear that? Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? As Christians, I think we, we're in a place where we need a makeover. I've often watched Christian television. I was in America for a number of years back, and I was watching Christian television when we didn't really have Christian television. And um, I used to sit for hours watching the Christian television, and, and I was somewhat disgusted at what was allowed to be on television in the guise of Christi- Christianity. And what really happened with people is that they look at themselves kind of like the same way as that person who stepped out with their undercut purple hair, green and orange hair, and, and crop top and fishnet stockings and high heel shoes or whatever they wanted. And they look at themselves and they say, well, this is okay. Have you ever seen that show where the woman comes along and she, her friends come and say, listen, we're going to take out, out of her, her cupboard, we're going to take all the ugly clothes out and we're going to come. What, what is the name of that show? Huh? Anybody know? Is it just me that watches these girly shows? <laughs> anyway, the woman's got a shoot over there. They take the clothes, they take the ugly clothes out, and, and then they shoot it up a shoot, and she can never have them back again. And they do a, a sort of a fashion makeover. And she's devastated that you would actually throw those clothes away because those are her favorite things, you know. That's absolutely what she loves, and they just keep throwing clothes away. And then, of course, they give them a complete makeover. And as a church, sometimes we've got an image problem. We need an, an image consultant. You know those people that come alongside you and they, they, they assess your dress code and they say, listen, you can improve, you can look, you've got to dress for success. You know, yeah, we've got to be like Ashley, uh, wear skinny jeans, you know, be hip and modern. And um, you don't know how long it took me to get into these skinny jeans. It's an effort. Eh? But sometimes when people talk about Christianity and when we talk about who we are as Christians, they don't have some of the nicest things to say. It's kind of like they stand on the sideline like we do, or I do, watching people, and we sort of criticize what they wear. And they look at us, and we have this image that we think is great. And sometimes when you look at Christianity, what it stands for, sometimes we, we don't represent Christ. We are his am- ambassadors on the earth. We represent him. We represent who he stands for, what his kingdom stands for. And we want to represent him accurately. But we sometimes have the same kind of mindset as the Pharisees. The Pharisees kind of, Jesus called them a brood of vipers. He called them, you know, white and sepulchers. because you painted nicely on the outside, but inside you, 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 you're like full of dead men's bones. And Jesus said some very unkind things to the Pharisees. And uh, we as Christians should have, have people kind of assess us and say, how am I doing? How am I doing? And as Christian representatives, we want to dress appropriately for the kingdom. And I'm not talking about physical dress. I'm talking about spiritual dress, how we dress inside. We want to represent him. An informal survey was done. Sorry, my throat is hurting a little bit. Informal survey was done a few years back. And um, technology. And they asked five, the, the five top things that they said about Christians. They asked them, what do they think about Christians? When you look at Christians, what do you, what do you see? Well, they, they, they said things like this, judgmental, hypocritical, bigoted, narrow-minded, and arrogant. Almost sounds like what Jesus said to the Pharisees. And that's what people's opinion of us. It's an informal sooner. Obviously, they're going to be a little bit biased because they, they're speaking from a non-Christian point of view and they have a, a biased outlook at what Christianity is, but sometimes they say, that's who we are. 
And that's not, what, that's not necessarily what we are, but that's sometimes what we display when we walk around and people look at us. But when they asked about Jesus, they said, what do you, what do you think about Jesus? What do you, when it comes to mind, when you think about him? They said, well, Jesus is loving, kind, compassionate, wise, merciful, helpful, truthful, healing, and caring. Completely, com- the explanation was completely different to what Christianity was to the outward world. Now, we do know it is bias. But we are the polar opposites of what we should be. What should we be? What should we be? We should be just like Jesus. We should represent Him. The same Spirit that lives in Jesus lives in us. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same Spirit. Not bits of Him. The whole Spirit. And so we should represent Him accurately. One of the things I notice about us as a people is that we're the, the worst judge of character for ourselves. If you were to ask people what they think of you, you might not like their answers. So we just judge ourselves. Like when you get into your secular clothes, you stand in front of the mirror and you say, oh, that looks okay, like it's all neat, my hair's in place, it's all good. But do we ever stand in front of a spiritual mirror and say, listen, is my life right? Am I, am I dressed the way Jesus, inside, internally, or my attitudes, my emotions, my, my speech, my conduct, is it, is it good? Does it look good? And sometimes the answer has to be no. We need a spiritual makeover. So how do we do that? Firstly, we've got to do it. I've only got three points. It might take me an hour, but I've got three points. First thing we have to do is we have to clear out the closet. There comes a time when you have to clear out the closet. You have to take the old and buy some new stuff. Your old T-shirts, you know that T-shirt that you like so much, that pair of jeans that you wear over and over and over again. And invariably we say, look, I'm, I'm saving this shirt because I could use it for the garden. But actually it doesn't get used for the garden. We use it every now and then to go walk around it. And we do very much the same thing in our Christian life. I want you to, if you've got your Bibles with you, read Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. If you... Colossians 3, verse 5 to 9. So it says there, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you, having nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life, when your life was still part of the world, but now... It is time to get rid of anger, rage, malice, or malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And so one of the things that the scripture is telling us here is that we've got to get rid of certain attitudes and certain behaviors that don't look good on us. And when somebody says, what are you wearing? I said, listen, I'm wearing Christ." I'm, I represent him. I'm wearing JC brand. That's who I represent, the kingdom of God. And it's a, it's a battle for us to put to death the things of the world. It's, there's this never-ending struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Your, your flesh wants the old clothes. Your spirit wants you to get dressed in new clothes. But we have to get serious with ourselves and begin to throw some of these things in our Christian life away. We need to get rid of malice and anger and rage and all these things that so easily trip us up and they look so good to us while we're doing them. And we feel justified in what we do, but the truth of the matter is those things don't look good on you. And those are the things that people point to. They say, listen, you, you are, you, have anybody ever heard this statement? I thought you were a Christian. I didn't know Christians did that. The first, the, the first thing that people want to do is, is look at your behavior because they don't, they don't even know what Christians are supposed to do, but they somehow in their minds and hearts know that Christians aren't supposed to be like this. Don't, they don't represent him correctly. Matthew 5, verse 29 to, and 30 says this. It says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Whoa. Some hectic scriptures here. It says, better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body 
to go to hell. Now, I know that Jesus is speaking metaphorically here because we'd have one-eyed, one-armed monsters walking around. So we know it's metaphorical. We didn't, Jesus doesn't literally want you to gouge your eye out. But the truth of the matter is that's how serious God wants us to take care of these things that don't represent him. God wants us to take care of the stuff inside of us that doesn't look good on us. Because that's not who we are. That's our old man. That's our old nature that God says, that's who you are. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't make God love me more if I get rid of these things or don't get rid of these things. The Bible tells us we know for sure He loves us regardless. He says, while you were dead in your trespasses and sins, I died for you. When you spat in His face, He loved you. When you said nothing good about Him, He loved you. So God is not asking for you to change these things because he doesn't, He's going to love you more because you change Him. He just wants you to look good. How many times do we sit back in our life and actually have a real heart to heart with ourselves in front of the mirror of God's word and let it reflect? God, am I, are these things that you spoke to the Pharisees about, the, the, the kind of attitude that the Pharisees had and the stuff that they, are any of those reflecting on me? God, is there, are there some clothes that I need to throw out? Some language, some speech, some behavior, some habit, some thing that I'm involved in, some sin? That I, that I need to get rid of in my life. But we need to be serious about it, and we need, we need to kill those things and put them to death. See, most of us categorize things into good and bad things. Um, but truthfully, everything that is not of God produces death. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and the wages never change. It's always death. Not necessarily eternal death, but it means death to your circumstances where you are. If you continue doing something that is contrary to God's word, it will eventually affect you. You cannot get away with it. You think it's going to be okay, or you can dabble with it here and there, but the truth of the matter is the wages for that is death. And God loves you. It's, not, it's irrelevant. This doesn't affect his love, but he knows that he wants the very best for you. He doesn't want you to hurt yourself. He wants you to love him for who he is and, and just accept his grace and forgiveness but he wants you to deal with this stuff in your life because it's going to hurt you. It'll produce death. Most of us go through the list of things. And we say, okay, sexual immorality. Oh, that's a really bad one. You know? we, we can't have that. And some young people generally say, yeah, but we live in a new day. You know, we, we more advanced now in society. And, and no, no, sexual immorality is still the same. The wages are still the same. It doesn't matter what century you live in. It's going to hurt you no matter what you, what you think. It doesn't matter where the age goes. It doesn't matter what society tells you. The wages of that sin are still death. You see, God wants you to live a life that brings blessing. The word impurity in that passage of Scripture in Colossians talks about the lust or evil desire or the word pornea, which which basically we know what it means. The word pornography comes from and People get involved in that. You'll be surprised how many Christians are involved in pornography. And you think it's just a guy thing. But it's not. Apparently one in three women are involved in pornography. You see, because we're all people. We can have any kind of lust that we, any desire, it can be anybody. It doesn't matter. It's not a girl or a guy thing. But most of us think because it's a secret sin, something that's quiet and nobody can see, that it's not going to affect us. Who does it hurt? I had a guy in my church one day, he wanted to uh, sleep with his girlfriend. He was a much older guy, ironically. And he wanted to move in with his girlfriend. He says, but who does it hurt? So, well, the problem is it doesn't, it's not a question of who it hurts, it's just who made the rules. I don't make the rules. If it's up to me, do what you want to. But Jesus made the rules and said, listen, if you don't do it my way, it's going to hurt you. And while you're sleeping with this woman and then you decide you've had enough of her and you're going to not hurt somebody else and then you'll not hurt somebody else and you'll not hurt somebody and all those not hurt people are going to be very hurt, including yourself. And so God says, listen, I want you to get rid of all these kind of things out of your life. I want you to get rid of greed, worshipping stuff. Instead of God. It's tough to listen to some of this stuff because we all struggle in some way with something that is in our life, something that is deep down and deep seated. 
Some people worship their cars, their home, their houses, their spouse. We can, anything that we put before God, God says, listen, I want you to put those things aside. Those things will hurt you. Anger, rage, malice. Put those things aside. And, you know, we think, well, those things aren't so bad. Gossip and backbiting. We can destroy people's lives because we think it's harmless. But there is no sin is sin. God says, listen, I want you to deal with it. It doesn't look good on you. And so God turns around, and when you get involved in some of this stuff, and he turns around and he said, what are you wearing? And your friends go, are you, are you going to wear that? Are you actually going to go out in the world like that? I think you should change. But you know what happens when somebody comes to us and they, they try and help us? We get offended, just like the shows. You need to watch the shows if you see them. People get offended because they love that stuff. It's so much a part of who they are that they battle to get rid of it and say, listen, in order for change to come, you have to get rid of some stuff. Otherwise, it won't change. And also, this is what I know about this stuff, is that you can't change it on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. You can try and strive. You're going to have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Because there's stuff that is so entrenched, and we're so comfortable with it. We're so comfortable with that shirt of greed, that pair of pants of pride, you know, that hat of arrogance. We're so comfortable with that stuff. We, we want to carry on using it because it, it just feels good. But somebody turns around to you and says, listen, are you really going out with that? St wearing that stuff is, is your... That attitude that you have right now, are you, are, you, are you actually wearing that? What are you wearing? Go look in the mirror again. So that's the first point. Get rid of some stuff. You have to get rid of some stuff. And tonight I want us to think about your own life. It, we could, it's very easy. It's not easy for me to point out somebody else's stuff. Because we don't like to judge our own characters. I, I've, I've been in the ministry for... I'm 27, but I've been in the ministry for about 30 years. I don't know how that works. But, but the reality is we, nobody, none of us like to be corrected. And somebody comes alongside of you and says, listen, you, you need not, maybe you need to stop backbiting or stabbing people in the back or something. Or maybe you need to stop that activity or that way of speaking. And people get offended because they like it. One of my weaknesses over the, over the course of time, I love, I love to make people laugh. It's nice to see. I, I'm, but invariably, I also make people cry, but I, don't want, I prefer the laughing thing. And so I like to make people laugh. But what happens with most of the, us that like to make people laugh is we'll stand in a crowd of people and the, and the jokes will get a little bit, little bit on the edge and they'll go a little bit further into the edge. And, and eventually we say, and, then we, and we know we shouldn't have said that. And then we have to pull back. And if somebody gets offended and walks away, and then you feel, oh, self-righteous. Don't tell me he's never told a bad joke in his life, you know. Because we don't like to be corrected. Get rid of the stuff. And you'll have less pain in your life. Secondly, we need to up if, once you get rid of the stuff, you need to update the wardrobe. Because if you get rid of all the stuff, you've got nothing to wear. And, and I just thank Jesus for clothes. Let me tell you, clothes make us look far better than we used to. I, I feel sorry for Adam and Eve. Remember that's what Adam said to Eve, Eck at your leaf. Okay. Um, yeah, it's lame. It's one of those dad jokes. Yeah. My daughter says I'm the dad joke king, you know. I am a little bit young to be a dad, but believe it or not, I am. So we need to update our wardrobe. We need to go and find some new clothes. We need to... Uh, there's something about old clothes that when you put them in a, you know, we, we don't really want to get rid of them, so we put them in a the cupboard. We just put them to one side, the T-shirt, you know, and the pants. We just put them to one side. We don't really want to get rid of them, but we know our wife's nagged us a little bit, so we put them to one side, and we say, no, no, we, we're going to get rid of them. But what happens is invariably those old clothes seem to filter back into our wardrobe again, somewhere along the line, and we, the old man in the, in the, 
in the spiritual sense, the old man, the stuff creeps back into our life. If we don't take care of it, like Jesus said, you know, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, you know, like if we don't, aren't serious about it, that stuff will creep back into our life before you know it. And so if you want to turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 10 to 15, it says, They put on your new nature and be renewed, in, in your, uh, uh, renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and He lives in us all. Since God chose you to be holy people He loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other, or make allowance for their faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, with, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace, and always be thankful. So what we need to do is that we need to learn to replace anger with tender-heartedness, or selfishness, or arrogance with some other attribute in our life, or mercy, produce mercy in our, our lives, clothe ourselves with kindness, and patience, gentleness, humility. It sounds very much like what? The fruits of the Spirit, doesn't it? The fruits of the Spirit, how many of you know when you get the fruit of the Spirit, who's the fruit for? Who's fruit, who's, what's the fruit of the Spirit for? Is it for you or is it for somebody else? It's for other people, isn't it? Because you you've never seen a, f- a fruit tree eat its own fruit, have you? So God has created us to produce fruit so that other can pick the fruit that we have. So when you, got, when you say, listen, and I get it all the time, people that don't go to church and say, no, no, I'm very patient. I says, really? What church do you go to? No, I don't go to church. Well, it's never been tested then. Because church life can test you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm patient. Really? I've got a sister dingbat over here. Let me explain. Come sit down, talk to sister dingbat or brother sandpaper. Talk to them and see how your patience level is. And all of a sudden, a guy flies off the handle and realizes, oh, I don't have patience. I don't have patience for these people. You see, we say, no, we're very loving until we have to actually love. That's why we need church. Iron sharpens iron. We, we need each other, whether you like it or not. It's the fact is that somebody along the line is going to cause you to have to exercise the fruit of patience. We go, Jesus, I need you right now. I need you. I need this fruit of patience, Jesus, please. And, and don't ask God for patience because he'll give it to you. Because the only way you get patience is by developing it. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. God is going to test those things. Only way you know that you're good at those things is when they're tested. The way you know that a surgeon is good is that he's passed his exam with flying colors. How many of you want to do brains, get your brain surgery done on you by a guy that got 35% in university? It's like, no, 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 you didn't pass the test. I like I like it, guys that have gone through the fire a little bit and they've, they've worked and maybe failed and succeeded, failed and succeeded, and eventually got it right. I'd rather have that guy than a guy that says, no, no, I've got patience. I don't go to church. I never see people. But I am an absolute demonstration of the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. The only way you're going to get it is when you have a relationship with people. And so you have to now replace these things in your life. One of the things that I think I, I find a lot is that people battle with forgiveness when something really hard or difficult has been done to them. But yet Jesus tells us that we must forgive because he forgave us. I mean, let's face it, how many times have we failed God? And he's so faithful. And Jesus says, the disciples say, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? He said, seven times? No, no, seven times, 70 times a day. Now, if that's a requirement for God, how much is the requirement for us? I say, how much is the requirement on himself? So we probably fail him 
hourly in my case. But he's faithful to forgive me. And that's why when somebody does something against me, even though it hurts, I have to say, I forgive you, because Christ forgave me. And that's where you exercise the fruit. You exercise what the Holy Spirit puts inside of you. See, we feel we we can harbor unresolved issues, and we can, but you don't understand what he did to me. You don't understand what she did to me. We have no right to hold on to that stuff. God says, I want you to take that. That's your old wardrobe. You've got a new nature now. All things are passed away. The old, all things have become new. Now, you, you, you may, now you're a forgiving person. You have my heart. Remember how I forgave you? That's how it's going to work. You've got to forgive others. And it should be such a part of our life because we, we're so used to putting it on. Every day I put on forgiveness. And, and forgiveness is one of many sins, obviously, that we unforgiveness, but one of many things that we deal with. But the truth is that the more we realize that we have to put this on on a daily basis, a lot of people struggle with it, and I say, listen, it's, it's not a thing that you just decide one day you're going to forgive. It's something that you, when, when the feelings and all those emotions rise up, that you have to say, now, nah, Lord, I, I choose. I make a choice to forgive. I know those feelings are not good, and I, and I don't want that, God, you forgave me. Or, and when you see yourself greedy or, or malicious or, or, or battling with sexual sin or whatever, whatever the thing is in your life, whatever that thing is, and I know that we think one sin is worse than other, but the Bible says you if you fall short of one of the commandments, you fall short of them all kind of thing. So, and it's not about the love of God. It's just that God wants you to change because he loves you so much. So how do, we, how do we do this? Firstly, the first thing that we have to do is we need to change our hearts. We need to surrender our hearts before God. Colossians 3.16 says, let, let this message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And so, so we have to have this relationship with God, and then God begins to work us in our hearts and changes our heart. And we say, God, I can't do this on my own. I, I, I know I need to get new clothes. I know I've had bitterness and anger and resentment, and I've had all these other bad attitudes, and, and the, the, the Bible's replete with different things that we, that we hold on to. But he said, God, I need you. First, I've got to get my relationship right with you. And secondly, he says, now that we, we are changed in our hearts, Full with the Holy Spirit, we're ready to go on and say, God, I need a family that I can connect to. Somebody that's going to hold me accountable to the things of God. Not somebody that dictates to you, but somebody that just says, hey, are you going to wear that? Are you, are you really going to wear that? But that's, that's not who you are. That's your old man. Are you going out with that attitude? And so we need to get hooked into some sort of friends or home groups are a good, great place to be because home groups are, you've got home groups here, don't you? Or life groups, souls, whatever they call them, different things, same thing. But it's in those places where people can challenge you and, and you can say, listen, I'm really battling and somebody can encourage you and, and give you a, something to, to hold on to, give you a scripture or pray with you and help you through this process. Or they maybe even see and identify something in your life that you didn't know because you know, we all got blind spots, and they call blind spots for a reason. We can't see them. You know, I, 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 my church would be a great place if they were all like me. And most of us think that's the truth about ourselves. We think this church would be, if George was just like me, we wouldn't have any problems. No, we'd kill each other. God made us different for a reason. And so we... Get connected. Get connected in corporate worship. Come together. I love the worship. I, it's just my, the thing that changes everything. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. God can change in a moment what you can't change in a lifetime. And so in worship, we begin to corporately get together. And, it, and then we serve Him. We serve Him. And it kind of, Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, do it for Him, because you love Him. And so when, I, 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 when we, we planted a church many years ago, and, and I, I remember I used to have to carry the sound equipment. We still sit up and take down. We're in a school hall. We still, every Sunday, thank Jesus for what you've got. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. That's a, no, no, that's pretty weak, eh? Say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've got. For 17 years, I've been sitting up taking down. It's a long time. But I remember when we started, I used to carry these speakers, little, not, not quite that but big. 
set up the drums, your electronic drums, and set up the speakers and carry, and people will talk to you while you're doing it. Their hands in their pockets, and they watch you, walking backwards and forwards, carrying equipment, and, and nobody says, hey, listen, can I, can I help you? Eventually, it started changing, and I think, and, and I used to have an attitude. I used to go to God. I said, God, you know, I don't know any other pastor that has to do this. I mean, to this day, I still have to do the media, set up the sound, and set up the me- That's, oh, I'm not special. I'm just like everybody else. But I used to get, I said, God, you know, other pastors don't have to do this. You know, George doesn't have to do this on a Sunday. He can have coffee, come in here, saunter in five minutes before, and he can just sit down and be all fired up and ready to preach. I've got to work. I'm sweating, and Yes, like big sweat marks in my arms, and I've got to say, and I've got to be happy. And God used to tap me on the shoulder and say, um, <clears throat> So, who are you doing this for? And I go, Oh, oh God, I'm sorry, man. I, I, this is about you, it's not about me. And you know, all the work, when you get to that place where you drop it, and you say, God, you know what, I'm doing this for you. I'm serving you and your people. All the work goes out of it. Have you ever asked a teenager to wash the dishes? Mm, mm. That's hard work. I'll wash my plate, the plate that I, and knife and fork that I dirtied. This is not my children. This is other people's children. I'll wash my plate, you know, because, because after all, I didn't dirty those other plates, and why should I wash them? But, you know, when you, when you get to the place where you, where you let it go and say, listen, I, I'm going to do this. There's no work in it. It takes you a few minutes and it's done. But everything is hard when you do it for yourself. When you've got a, some other reason that you're doing it. You're doing it because you love God. You're doing it because you love His people. And I, I'm, I'm not suggesting I never get, there's still moments I say, God, please, just give us some building somewhere. Lord, let harvest. Just send us a big check. <laughs> Lord, Jesus. Oh, sorry, faith without hints is dead, they say. <clears throat> so... Um, that is in the Bible, isn't it? What characteristics in your own life can you pick out and say, how am I doing for time? It's probably over already. Am I? You see, when, I have to say this. When, when I grew up in the ministry, I, I worked for a guy, and if you didn't speak for 45 minutes, he said you didn't prepare. And I, I, this is the gospel truth. So, if you fall asleep, I'll let you. It's okay. Just let the word just wash over you. <laughs> what attitudes and things in your life, what sins maybe, or what things that are you holding on to in your life that you need to get rid of? You've identified that there are some old, old clothes maybe, and there's some things in your life that you need to get rid of. But the third and last point, you'd be happy to know, and not conclusion. Third and last point is, you need to try the clothes on at home. Because there is no better place to try on new clothes than in front of your family. Because they'll tell you, nah. and your wife says, do these jeans make my bum look big? And you say, no, it's the hamburgers you eat that make your bum look big. <laughs> uh, and you duck. And you duck when something gets thrown at you. And, but that's not in my wife's case, that's I just hear these things from other men. But when you try stuff on at home, you can get an honest opinion. You know, is this, is this see-through? Does this fit me? Is it too tight? Is it too loose? And it's, it's nice to get somebody's opinion of something. Of course, it's a little bit different with women. They'll ask for your opinion, and you say, that looks lovely, and then they go and they change and put something else on. That's how it works. Have you ever noticed that? Because it's for some reason or other, it's nice to ask us, but really... It's kind of like, if you say it's nice, it can't be good. I'm going to go change. I don't know. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 to 25, and, and I, I love this passage of Scripture. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. Okay, we can just stop there. Oh, no, no. I was, I was going to read on. As is fitting for those who belong to the Lord, husbands, love your wives, and never treat them harshly. Children, always just behave. Always obey your parents. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. 
Now, God's not promoting slavery, but there was slavery in those days. And he's saying, listen, even if you're a slave, have a different mindset. Do what you do as unto the Lord, even if it's difficult. And God's not saying slavery is good. Um, try to please them all, all the time. Not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly in whatever you do. As, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as, you, as your reward. And the master, you are, the master you're serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong you've done. For God has no favorites. What's he saying? He's saying, clothe yourself in humility. There's some times when you have to submit to somebody. There's some times when you have to surrender your your heart, your opinions, your thoughts. Because you know, the bigger the, the church becomes, the more thoughts there are, the more opinions there are. You know, it's like God tells George, listen, I want you to march around Jericho. I want you to go around six times, and the seventh time I want you to shout, blow the trumpets, make a big noise. And then you get the group on the one side said, what is he, is George crazy? Shouting never brings down walls. Where, what is he thinking? So they get their little group together, And then the other group come along and said, listen, George, we agree. March around, but let's do it three times, not not seven times. Let's do one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. And they spiritualize it. It's like we, you know, another group gets together and they said, listen, man, George, let's not go around six. Let's just go around once. It's like we're old, man. We've got sore knees. We can't do this. Now let's just keep it short. Then you get another group that says, oh, it's never going to work. I don't know what he's thinking. He's been smoking the wacky weed. Is something wrong? It's not going to happen. And so all these opinions happen, and God, all George is trying to do is be obedient to God. And he's saying, please, guys, just come along with me. Let's just go around quietly seven, six times, and the seventh time, let's make a noise. You get people that will do everything in their power not to make it happen, and you get a group of people that say, listen, George, we're behind you, 100%. I don't know how it's going to work. It doesn't make any sense to me. But listen, I surrender to you. I, I, I respect you as a leader. I honor you as that. I'm, I'm standing behind you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to march. If, it, if that's what God's saying to you, that listen, I'm ready. And if it doesn't work, well, so what? We tried. But there's so many opinions. So God's trying to tell us, listen, we need to clothe ourselves sometimes with people around us. We need to put ourselves in a place where we surrender to Him. We need to be gentle, patient. We need to ask him, say, God, listen, you put this person, this authority figure. Some wives struggle to submit themselves to the Bible. says we submit ourselves one to the other. What happens if you reach an impasse in your marriage? Somebody's got to make a final decision. We are going, we're not going, we're doing, we're not doing. And sometimes you're going to have to humble yourself, even if you're a slave, if you're a child. If you, and that's one of the hardest things. And God says, do it unto me, with that heart. So you might not see eye to eye sometimes with people, but there comes a time when you surrender your will and say, God, I'm going to be obedient to what you're doing in somebody else's life. And so one of the greatest things is to practice the things of God at home. Because, you know, when we go outside, it's easy to disguise who we are. You know, I can, hi, you brother, praise God, hallelujah. And at home, it's like, oh, you, he's such a cow. You know, he's like, I can't stand you, you know, talking to your wife. And everybody thinks that you're the most amazing man or woman. But we need to try it on at home. Because you know what, if, it's, if it works at home, it'll work anywhere in the world. You know that we take our family, the closest, we, we generally hurt the people closest to us. Do you know that? Why is that? Because we know we can because they're not necessarily just going to run off. You, get, you hurt somebody, you speak badly to somebody else, they punch you in the nose. And at that time, he realizes it's better to give than receive. So try it on at home. Say, listen, does this look good on me? Does it look good? Is God going to be happy with me? This attitude that I display at home, this way... This loving nature. Am I demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit at home 
Because if I can demonstrate them at home, I can demonstrate them anywhere I like. It's easy to say I love people from afar off. Send them a check. But when you see a person toe-to-toe that's in your face, and sometimes it's harder to love that person that's right there in your family, in your church, try it on at home. How would you characterize yourself? How would you see yourself? Would you say that people look at you and say, are you going to wear that? How many times have I seen Christians talk on television and I go, oh, don't give them a microphone, please, because they're going to say something to damage Christianity for all time. Because something hasn't changed in their heart. They're still wearing the old man. And so how many of us tonight are at a place where we still wearing some of our old man? Are we opening up ourselves, saying, listen, God, I want to throw those things away. I want to put some new things. I want to replace them with good stuff. Because if I don't replace it with good stuff, I'm going to, just the old man is just going to creep in. And I'm going to stand in front of my family. I'm going to say, whether it's a church family or your home, your real home, stand in front of them and say, how do I look? You look okay. You look good. Maybe there's this thing that maybe you can change those shoes. Or maybe you can put a scarf on. Maybe you've been very unforgiving lately and that's not really who you are. And maybe you need to exercise some forgiveness. Maybe you've had anger and jealousy, pride in your life. Maybe you can change that. Are you ready to assess yourself? Why don't you stand for a moment? See, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit. And we need to ask Him to shine the light of His love in our hearts. You know, one of the things I note about God is the closer I get to Him, the more flaws I realize I have. It's kind of like a diamond. When you look at a diamond, you don't see all the inclusions and you don't see anything. But the closer you get with the monocle, the jeweler's thing, you know, the closer I look, the more I see. And so the Holy Spirit comes and He shines His light on you and you think, oh God, I didn't realize, I didn't realize I was like that. And one of the best places we can be as Christians is is a place of humility and say, God, I want to be different. I want to be different for you. I just want to pray with you as you journey this through the week and maybe think about yourself and say, listen, maybe you ask somebody close to you, is there something that you see in me? Some item of clothing in my spiritual makeup that maybe doesn't look so good. It's a tough question because sometimes you're not going to like the answer. But you're in a family that love you and they're not condemning you, they want to help you. And so if you get to that place, you say, God, what is it that you'd like me to change? And then buy yourself some new clothes. Say, God, I'm going to put on love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. I'm going to put those things on. Father, today, we thank you that you are the God that loves us beyond measure. Just like we sang, you leave the 99 to find the one. You love us so much, Father. And Father, we want to accurately represent you in this kingdom. We want to accurately represent who you stand for and who you are. We want to accurately stand in front of you and say, God, I want to be the best me I can be in front of you. I want to be the best me I can be in front of the people that I serve, that my family members around me. I want to be the best model of who you expect me to be. I want to represent and be an ambassador for you that is above and beyond my normal situation. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would reveal to all of us areas in our heart and lives that we need to change. That maybe they don't look good on us. We wore that item of clothing for so many years, we don't realize that, Father, it's not, it's not in fashion anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And so, Father, we pray that we just pray today that you would, by your Spirit, just begin to quicken our hearts so we can feel your Spirit rummaging, as it were, through our clothing our spiritual clothing, and saying, what are, we, what are we putting on? And so I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you touch every heart in this place, that they'd be transformed from what they are now to what you want them to be.
In Jesus' name, amen.